Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to tonight's at, uh, Creative Cloud for Photographers webinar with Richard West and Richard Curtis. I'm Boris Bergman from Datacolor, and I'd like to welcome you for this webinar. Allow me just a few seconds. We will have a presentation in a few seconds from now. We will start with Richard Curtis from Adobe, and um, I'm sure it will be very interesting to see how he works with the Adobe products. And afterwards, you will see Richard West uh, regarding some color management tips and tricks. Okay, that's from me, from my side. At the end of this presentation, we will go into a chat where you have the possibility to enter all the questions you have. And of course, this webinar will be recorded and you will be able to um, view the recording when you receive the follow-up mail tomorrow afternoon or maybe the day after. Okay, so thank you. Uh, Richard, Rich, are you there? Yeah. We are indeed, yeah. Okay, Hi, great. So what I will do now, I will turn Richard Curtis into moderator. So please share your screen with us. Okay, so hopefully, Boris, you can now see my screen. Yeah, we'll do. Perfect. Okay. okay. It's I you. Will, it's you now. I will start. Thanks, Boris. Hi, guys. Welcome to this session today um, of Creative Cloud for Photography. And uh, just to introduce myself, I'm sure that uh, a few of you have already um, know who I am and listened to some webinars that we've done before. But I work for Adobe here in the UK. I can be contacted on Twitter at Richard Curtis if you want to follow me to get updates on what we're doing in the future and what we're doing today. Um, but essentially, I look after all of the uh, imaging products here in the UK for Adobe. So that's Photoshop, Lightroom, Lightroom Mobile, Creative Cloud, Workflows for Photographers. I'm also a photographer as well, so I'm active and I do go out a lot shooting. I've just come back from India, an interesting shoot. Um, and, uh, and today, what I'd like to do is just go through um, you know, what Creative Cloud for Photography is all about and introduce you to some new concepts. Um, inside Lightroom, uh, inside Photoshop, but also around Lightroom Mobile and a new application called Photoshop Fix on the iPhone and the iPad. Also got some demos for you as well, so the majority of this presentation will be around demos, and then at the end of the presentation, after Richard's uh, done his piece, we'll talk about Q&A and get you to answer, ask any questions that you may have, and we can answer them for you. So before I start, I just want to go through the Creative Cloud Photography Plan at a very high level and just really kind of reposition the fact that the Creative Cloud Photography Plan is a way of using and accessing the desktop applications to edit your photographs, be it raw files or JPEG files or PSDs or TIFFs, utilizing both Lightroom and Photoshop in a creative workflow to enable you to make better pictures and amazing pictures. Now, one of the misconceptions is that some people think that you have to uh, store images in the Adobe Cloud, and that's not correct. You can actually store your images on your local machine and your local hard drives. That's how it's intended to work. You can, however, access those from the web using the mobile side of things, but you don't have to put your content inside the any cloud-based system. So I just want to make sure that's absolutely clear. Um, so if you have any questions on that, we can ask them at the end. We'll be more than happy to answer them for you. Creative Cloud Photography Plan is also um, about mobile working and introduced the concept of working on the mobile devices to edit your raw images, uh, also to edit your uh, any PSDs or any JPEGs you have, maybe that you've taken from your phone or that you've taken from an iPad, and then you've um, got them in your desktop version of Lightroom, and you can coexist, have it, have that coexisting in, inside your workflow as well. So it's a very different kind of concept, um, but we'll go through that today so you can you can see that. And also, one thing about the photography plan that you may not know about, and it's really kind of cool, is the fact that you can now publish your content out using something called Adobe Slate. Adobe Slate is a way that you can put text and images together to make something very compelling to share across the web or across a phone or an iPad or a tablet or whatever. So we'll look at some of that today as well. So the Creative Cloud is, you know, a little biased, However, it is really good value for money because you don't just get the applications of the desktop, but you also get lots of mobile applications as well and other creative um, avenues for your, for your work. Okay, so one of the things that is kind of 
is with revolutionary in the Adobe world is something called the Adobe Creative Sync. And Adobe Creative Sync is really important when it comes down to both Creative Cloud but also to, to Lightroom and Lightroom Mobile. Creative Sync is a way that we keep all the assets synchronized between your uh, desktop application and your mobile um, applications that you're working with. So if you are working on the desktop in Lightroom and you want to work on your files on the iPad or the iPhone, you can then um, enable them through the, um, the Lightroom mobile mechanism inside Lightroom and that utilizes a Creative Sync and it makes sure that your content is replicated through into those devices and then any changes that you make on those devices will then be replicated back to your desktop and actually out onto other devices that you may have connected as well. So that's the Creative Sync. Now it's really important and it's a really great piece of technology that kind of runs behind the scenes and makes sure everything's all up to date and running. I want to introduce a new app called Photoshop Fix. Uh, it's available on the App Store, so you can download it after this session, have a play with it. And Photoshop Fix has been designed to be like a lightweight Photoshop, um, enabling you to implement things like um, liquify and lighten and darken in using your finger. It's been designed for the new iPad Pro when it comes out and for the Apple Pencil. So it means that you can actually use very precise strokes to light and darken your images and to actually do some work on your images on the go using Photoshop technology inside the mobile application. The core benefit of, of doing this is that Photoshop Fix actually keeps all of the um, layers and all the adjustments that you make to the image all non-destructive so when you go across into Photoshop on the desktop you then get, get access and refine those steps that you made inside Photoshop Fix. And we'll show you that a little bit later on as we get into the demonstrations. Okay, so let's get into the demonstrations. I don't want to bore you with PowerPoint because it's um, a bit boring in the world of creativity. So um, let's get straight into some of these demos. Now, what I'd like to do is, I, I love going back to Lightroom 4. Lightroom 4 was kind of groundbreaking for me and um, there's a, a couple of little sliders that are definitely worthwhile talking about and those sliders exist in the development module. And I'm sure everyone's using Lightroom and everyone's using the development module. We just really want to show people that maybe aren't using those or are new to Lightroom the power of what you can do inside just a basic panel. Now Lightroom can be a little bit overbearing sometimes, it's got a lot of things on the screen to enable that creativity to flow without having um, the uh, any disruptive uh, activity inside your creative flow, but when you get into the development module over here, Lightroom split into these tabs, um, you're able to go in and modify the exposure so it can fix your uh, your pictures that you take on your camera. This is all non-destructive so nothing's going to happen to your, your images. And then under here you have the highlights and shadows and what these will do is these will bring back the highlights in the image. Now the most powerful one for me is the shadows. I can control my shadows now and bring back all that data in the shadows and look, I can reveal all that data that's in that picture, which was completely different to what it was a second or so ago. See that? So it means that I've got a lot more control about the data recovery inside that image, um, which also means I can then really tighten up my white point, get where I want it to be. I can turn on the indicators up here, which will show me, oops, sorry, the indicators too close to the screen indicators up here which will show me any clipping so I can see when the white point is clipping with the red marker over here so I'm getting exactly where it needs to be so it's nice and bright and I can go and clip the blacks and the blacks will then clip and I now get a very punchy image just turn that off for a second I get a very punchy image and I can very quickly display what it looks like in full screen mode using the F key and it gives me that nice full screen view of the image so now I can start working with my with my picture. So I just wanted to go over that again. I know that most people are probably using that as well, but just for those people who aren't using it, it's a very, very powerful way of uh, editing their pictures. So to switch a gear, I want to go just into Lightroom 6 um, territory and just want to cover off some of the really cool features that came out in Lightroom 6 or Lightroom CC that comes with the photography plan. So if I just go into the development module now, you can see this picture here. Now this is something I took a few months ago now. Um, in, the, in the Lake District and you can see that we have the sky 
And the sky is kind of, um, you know, got a lot of cloud detail in it, but it doesn't look very dramatic. And it was a very dramatic day. It was about to rain. And I want to use the, um, I want to use Lightroom to convey that to the viewer. And I can do that very quickly by going to the um, graduated filter. I'm going to use the graduated filter to actually pull in a graph into the image, and it will darken the areas in the sky. And you can see that happening now. Now, if I turn on the overlay, you can see here that actually, when I drag that a bit further down, you can see the mask goes into the mountain, which isn't ideally what I what I want actually, um, because if I turn that mask off again, you can see the mountain getting getting dark at the top, and I really don't want that to happen. So, previously, you could go in and you could use the adjustment brush. Um, or you could use uh, the radial filter, but that's not really going to give you a lot of control. One way of giving you a lot of control is by using a graduated filter and then using the brush. And what the brush will do is it allows you to go in and make adjustments to the mask. So if I just turn the mask on again for a second, and then you see that I've got a plus indicator in the little uh, marker on the screen. That's adding a uh, adding mask data to the mask. If I press the Alt key, it will go to a negative, and the negative will remove content from the existing mask, and it will allow me to really clean up the areas that that mask is actually now covering. So you can see I've got the feather on, so the inner disc is the actual uh, effect itself, and the outer is the feather. So you can see that I can really blend that into the existing mask. Now if I turn the mask, off and move outside the panel. I have my little widget set to be automatic, which means that when I'm in the picture, I see the I see the uh, controls. When I'm out of the picture, I go to the controls. So I can really very quickly look at the uh, composition and look at the elements as I'm working with Lightroom. So you can see that's a really great feature, and we think that's going to be great for photographers. And I know a lot of people are using that today. Now we also know a lot of people are using um, HDR. HDR is a very popular technique for, for Lightroom users. And what we have um, inside Lightroom CC now, Lightroom 6, is a way to actually create um, panoramics, or sorry, HDR images directly in, in Lightroom. Now, these three images here that I have uh, were exposed on my uh, Fuji camera. And they were exposed at one stop under and one stop over and one at a zero point of um, exposure, so it means that I have a one-stop bracket, a three-frame one-stop bracket, and I'm going to use that because in this scene I can't get all that tonal range in one in one uh, in one shot. So what I can do to merge them together, rather than using the, uh, the the old technique of HDR, which really kind of oversaturates certain parts of the image, is actually using uh, Lightroom's non-destructive technology and RAW technology to actually go and create me. The HDR. So you can see here, when I right click on the images, I can use the photo merge feature HDR, and this will then um, go in and create me a preview, but it will also go in and um, pull that data together, but automatically masking out areas that I don't need because it knows where the highlights, the shadows, and the midtones are across all those three images. It will now create them for me and create me a single image. Now, the important thing is that Lightroom will go and create me a new 16-bit RAW file. And that 16-bit RAW file will contain the results of the output from this process. So it means that I'm still working with RAW data and RAW space, even though I've merged them together. So you can see here, we've got deghosting in here as well. So if you've got things that move, especially on landscapes, you've got trees that may move in the wind. Deghosting will remove them from the frames where you don't have repeating objects through the frame. So say, for example, you've got a tree that exists in one frame because the wind moved it and doesn't exist in the rest. It will then remove it from the other frames and only keep it in the single frame. And then what I can do is merge. Now, the nice thing about Lightroom and using um, HDR or panoramics in, in Lightroom is that it will push it to the background. And the background task will run, which means I can continue working on my edits while this is now running in the background. So I'm not actually having to lock, or it's not locking up my desktop um, to do that. We have the same for panoramics. So actually, let me just get rid of this image here, because this is actually a, a one I built earlier. But you can see we have these three images, and these three images are of the same scene, but I just got the camera 
and did three frames and overlapped each frame by a third of a frame to have that continuity across frames. If I right click on those three images and go to photo merge panorama and it will now run the panorama for me and it will do exactly the same in panoramics as it is in HDR because it creates me a raw file of 16 bits in value and pulls out all that data for me and creates me a new raw file then to work with inside Lightroom and that's an, a really important point so let's just let's, 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 um, finish what it's doing now um, create the panorama for me and you can see it does that. I've got different ways to project so I'm just going to use a spherical because that's the, an easy way of doing it especially in this scenario. You might use perspective if you're doing something with buildings and you're taking it from a funny angle. If I press the merge it puts it to the background and you can carry on working. So let's just go back to HDR while that's finishing and you can see that we have this image which is my HDR image which contains all the details from that shot. This looks exactly like the um, tunnel view in Yosemite as I shot it on the day that I shot it. Now it may be too much for you because Lightroom's actually been in and looked at the highlights and the shadows and made some assumptions based on how I want that scene to look. Now it may be that the highlights um, slider does need to go all the way to the left which, I, which is fine and that the shadow slider may need to come back slightly because I may need to just not open up as much or I can open up fully. It's up to you. You can make that choice because now you're working in raw space. You have access to all that data. What I can do is really tighten up on the black point to get impact and punch and use a white point to brighten up. Then I can use the clarity and what the clarity will do is boost mid-tone contrast and it will give it a nice three-dimensional effect. If I now move it into full screen, you will see that image render and you get a beautiful rendition of how tunnel view looked on that day I shot it using three frames to capture that full tonal range of all the shadows and the deep shadows all the way through to the highest highlight that I have in my scene. The highest highlight will be around these peaks or around um, El Capitan over here. So the panoramics I think is finished now as well so we can just go back to the library mode, go back to panoramics and you'll see at the end we have a panoramic. We can move that into full screen. Now you'll notice this we've got some, uh, we have some little flashes of areas of white there but what Lightroom's done is it's actually gone in and cropped it for me uh, to enable me to carry on working very quickly so it just takes that data out. What you could do as a post process is edit that in Photoshop and reverse content aware fill those away and you get that. So that's a quite a nice example. You can see a few uh, things that I need to fix around dust spots and that type of thing but overall it's done a pretty good, pretty good job. Okay, one feature that we brought out in, in Photoshop, in, sorry, in Lightroom CC and also in Photoshop Camera Raw something called the dehaze filter. And this has been a really cool filter that people really have enjoyed using and that's when you have a scene which has been taken in very very bright daylight and has got this horrible mist in the camera especially in the background and you can see there that I can't really see that back at mountain because it's been caught up in that mist that I have. So inside the development module under the effects panel we have this slider called dehaze Dehaze is uh, a way to either remove or add haze from the picture. So I want to add more haze to a picture, I could go to the left and that will add haze into the picture and make it a really kind of overcast day. Or I can go negative and look what should happen if I go negative. Negative actually starts to increase the saturation, pulls out that um, haze from the sky and it enables me to see now those mountains in the, in the background. So that's a really nice way of using it and cleaning the image up and getting a really nice usable image, especially from hazy scenarios. One trick there that you may want to try is that this works very differently when you work in black and white. Now, I'm sure you've seen um, Ansel Adams' pictures back from the 50s and the 60s where he's got this really black sky. Um, you can actually do the same thing using the dehaze filter and you can push it right to the right and you see how now you get that really large intensity of black in the sky and also in the shadows over here. So it's another way, another creative way of using that to be haze filter to give you much more contrast and much more boost inside your images very, very quickly just using Lightroom to add impact into, uh, into that scene. So I've been using that quite a lot on my black and white work just to add that impact and I've been putting it at 100% because it really has a good, uh, adds good drama to the, to the pictures. 
We have um, also added something called local white and black sliders. Now let's take this example here for example. If we look over here we've got some really nice details in this Japanese uh, monument roof and then we have this tree over here. The tree's good background and it puts, puts things into nice into context and this thing was in the middle of the woods. Um, but it may be that I want to pull the, the blacks and the whites out from this and set the white and the black point locally something which I can't do right now, I have to do everything on the whole image which I may not want to do. So I'm just going to go into the development module and what we've done is in the radial filter and also in the gradient filter and the adjustment brush is added a new um, control. So we just pull in a filter here, I've already got one there, that's why it's doubling up, so I'll just pull a filter in. And then in this filter you can see I've got the mask. Now I'm just going to reset the exposure because I don't want to touch the exposure. I just want to work on the local black and white values. So here's my grad pulled in. I have now the whites and the black sliders available on that local adjustment slider. So now I can just push the whites up to increase the white clipping point and the blacks to push that down only in that area. And you can see what it's doing over here. It's now starting to pull out that data and I can just move the grad into the position where I want it to do the adjustment change. So now I get that effect in that area. If I turn that on and off so you can see what it looks like before and after, that's before and that's after. So it only sets the white and the black point for the area that I like it to be applied. So it's a really nice creative effect on really low class adjustments, really starting to open up the local adjustments inside the Lightroom. Okay, so Let's go into Lightroom Mobile. Uh, Lightroom Mobile is a way that we can actually take our content to be used on our mobile devices. And as of such, we can use Android tablets now. We can use Android phone. Uh, we can also use the iPhone and, of course, the iPad to now do our work. So you can now work across all those platforms uh, anyhow you like. Um, and the most important thing is that Lightroom is always, or Lightroom Desktop, I should say, is always going to be the source of your content. Um, it's always going to be the master, and Lightroom on the mobile device is always going to be a slave to that master. Now, you can see here that we have this library full of content that I shot in America uh, last December, and you can see here I've got a picture that we're going to work on. Now, I want to work on this on my mobile device, because it may be that actually I need to go out to the store, or I need to go out uh, on a train or something, but I want to carry on my creative process, or even I want to sit on the sofa and work on my pictures rather than type the desktop. It may be as simple as that. Um, I may be traveling, I may be traveling somewhere I want to work on my pictures. To, um, to add these to uh, Lightroom Mobile, you just need to make sure Lightroom Mobile is running. So inside Preferences, you have Lightroom Mobile tab, and then there you log in with your uh, Adobe ID. Now, Adobe, the photography plan contains Lightroom Mobile. If you have a free uh, version, so you're not using the photography plan, but you have an Adobe ID, you can still log in now and use Lightroom Mobile on that account in a, in a limited way on the, on the phone. If you're fully subscribed though, you can sync content between the two. So it's a, there's, there's a, a freemium option there as well as a, as a paid option, so that's quite, quite a nice advancement there. Once that's turned on, Lightroom Mobile becomes available uh, and the activity is shown by clicking on the little headline on the identity plate at the top of the screen and you can see that it's syncing content to Lightroom Mobile as we speak. So how does it work? So inside Lightroom on the desktop you have, as you know, probably collections. Collections are a way to actually organize your content in a very uh, defined way. I can organize structure and narrative inside that collection because I can move things around. Uh, so for example, if I, if I see a bit of content here, I can move it around in a different position, which is great from editing in context of images or narrative. Now, um, this, these are all my piece of content that I got synchronized. I'm just going to add uh, a couple of other elements into here as well, some things that I did plan earlier. So these five here are not part of Lightroom Mobile. Now to get them into Lightroom Mobile, I just go to my collection and select the images from the folder and then uh, I can just drag them in. So I'm just find Lightroom Mobile which is here and drag these images into Lightroom Mobile and you see it goes to 29 and what happens is the synchronization increases by the number of images which are synchronized and it brings them through. Right, that's working quite nicely now. So I'm just going to go across to my phone 
and I'm just going to log in very quickly and you should be able to see my phone there and I'm just going to log in very quickly to my phone. Now you can see here in my phone I've got Lightroom Mobile open already and you can see here that I've actually got my um, my Lightroom Mobile catalog ready and waiting. I've already got some photographs synced in there like I mentioned but I've got others that are synchronizing now so they will come in as we're talking so you have to see them in, in near real time as they're coming through. Now let's just take a picture on here. I want to edit a picture and I mentioned we had this um, chloride picture here and I may want to edit it on my phone. Now the most important thing is that what Lightroom does on the desktop and through Creative Cloud Sync is it will take the uh, file that I'm working with and convert it to a RAW file, so a DNG file, a WDNG file, and that file will be 40 times smaller than the original RAW file, the original asset. So it means that these files on my mobile device are RAW, but they're much, much smaller, which will give me performance. So this is, for example, this is a DNG, for, uh, DNG for a file, it's 24 megapixels, and I can zoom in to this image at quite high resolution, and the maximum size on the long edge is 2,500 pixels. But it means that I can go in and start working with my image. So let me just go in and start editing it. Now, a couple of options here for editing. I can edit on my ratings. So I can choose if this is going to be a 3-star, 4-star, or 5-star. Or I can go to my adjustment panel. And in my adjustment panel, I can go in there, maybe change the temperature, or work on the exposure. And you see as I'm moving it, it now works in real time. Go to my shadows and pull the shadow area out. Use two fingers to move this around the screen. And the two fingers will give me an ability to be able to work on different parts of the image. And then I've got my highlights that I can work on. Pull my highlights back. And I can also work on my black point and work on my white point. Exactly the same as I would do on the desktop in Lightroom. I also have clarity to give it some boost. There you go. There's my clarity. So there's my picture. I'm getting pretty happy with that now. Now you'll see at the top of the screen we have this little plus. This is telling me that the adjustments are not being synced back to Lightroom Mix. I'm still working on the picture. Once I move off that picture, it will then start synchronizing that with the Lightroom on the desktop. So let's just go back to Lightroom on the desktop very quickly just to show you that change come through. Okay, so we're back in that collection on Lightroom now, and here's my image. Now, I'm just going to go into uh, development module, and what will happen is that as soon as that content has gone from the phone, synchronized through the Adobe Creative Cloud using the Creative Sync, it will then apply the adjustments made on my phone to my desktop version. And you can see it's just done it there. I didn't touch the screen. I didn't touch the phone. Everything came through automatically. So you've got automatic reconciliation of any assets that you have on the mobile device uh, or, or on the desktop. I can also back out. So this is all stored in the history. So at any point in time, I can reset that back to where I was. But I quite like it. It's quite, it's quite nice. Now, of course, the other thing is that you may want to use your uh, mobile devices for capturing content as well. So actually, you can take pictures now on Lightroom Mobile. So let's just go to Lightroom Mobile very quickly again. So I'm just going to switch around a little bit so you can see all of these pieces working. If I go back now to Lightroom Mobile, you can see now at the bottom of the screen you now have the camera. So you've now got horizontal positioning. You can see here this is my screen, which you can track of the time, so I'll go overrun. Um, but I can also go in and change my exposure on the fly as well. So I can reduce the exposure or increase the exposure. I can turn the flash on. I can work on different what my balance is. I can put a timer on. I can also take a picture, so I will load it inside Lightroom Mobile. So I can carry on working. That content will then be synchronized back to my desktop to carry on working on my desktop as well. Now, I'm just going to go into another, um, another aspect of, uh, of Lightroom Mobile, and that's the new adjustments with uh, Photoshop Fix. So I'm just going to find an image that um, I took on holiday. This was using my iPhone. I quite like because it's huge. Um, a huge model of Shiva above this temple. It's a massive thing. I thought it's fantastic. So I got out with my camera and I started to um, think I can really use that as a as a, a picture on Facebook because I really love it. It's about 30 feet high. Brilliant. Um, but I can make some adjustments here very quickly as I saw before. So this is, a, this is an iPhone picture. 
and I can just go in, I can change the Y balance, I can go in and make a selector, and I can go in and, and choose a different Y balance for this if I want to do, or maybe just the green, I can do that and change a, a Y balance and move it around so I get exactly what I want, which is fine. I can go in and work on my exposure, just as I could with Lightroom on my desktop, I can now work with this on my phone. Now, there's a couple of things I don't like here though. Um, I don't like those antennas, so I want to get rid of them. So what I can do is go into Lightroom Mobile, and what I have now is on the Edit In, on the right-hand side at the top, I have Edit In, and now these are linked to Photoshop Fix when you've got Photoshop Fix installed. So Photoshop Fix has got multiple functions inside Lightroom Mobile. One is healing, and one is liquefying. I'll talk about liquefying in a little while. The healing allows me to um, go into Photoshop Fix and automatically hand over the apps and hand this image over to Photoshop Fix for me to carry on working. Now I've got my spot heel. Now I'm just going to use, sorry, just going to use two fingers to uh, zoom in to my thing. And you can see these little arrows that I really don't like. I'm going to use a spot heel. Spot heel is a classic Photoshop tool for this type of work. I'm just going to hover and mark these areas really close to that edge with my finger. And you can see I can get rid of that on the phone nice and quickly with really good accuracy. So these are you know, professional tools that we're using now on the mobile device to clean up the image. Right, let's do something more. There, I can try and get rid of this with the auto fix. It's not doing a bad job, but I can also use clone stamp. So clone stamp, I can select the area that I want to clone, exactly the same as if I'm using Photoshop. I can go in and change the hardness, so I can choose a different soft or hardness based upon what I would like to use. So I choose a nice soft brush. Again, choose the area I want to remove. And then basically, you can then see me removing this area from the scene, reselecting just as I would do in Photoshop on the desktop. Just going to move that across. Just using two fingers just to move that across. I'm going to zoom over there, and you can see how I have something else over here. I do exactly the same thing. So take the clone heel and start removing that content just by selecting different areas, like I would in Photoshop. And it gives me a nice way to carry on working. They have a result that I can probably use. Okay, the little thing at the end. Let's just get rid of that one there, and it's gone. Okay, so all that's done on the phone. I can then touch and save that back into Lightroom Mobile. And you can see it comes back, we create a version, and we can now carry on working without the antennas that really cause that, um, that issue. Now, there's also, um, if we look at Photoshop Fix as a, an entity on its own without bringing it from Lightroom, it does have some other facilities that are really worthwhile looking at. So I'm just going to open up this. So this is Photoshop Fix. I'm going to go in and create a new canvas, and that canvas will be created from content from Lightroom or from my other content on my phone or Facebook or Dropbox or wherever it may be. If I go into Lightroom now, you will see it will open up my Lightroom content that's stored inside the Creative Cloud as a normal Creative Cloud entity. You can see here we have um, we have Richard who's co-presenting with me. I think that's a very old photograph, Richard. Uh, when you were you know, less handsome, obviously. Yeah, and more more dark hair as well, mate. <laughs> <laughs> um, so here's a picture actually of another presenter that you may know. Uh, who's very familiar with the Lightroom space, a guy called Dave Mallows. Yeah, Dave Mallows has got a, a, a nice little, very serious smile. I think we can actually do something a bit better to Dave and make him a bit more smiley. Um, so a couple of things that we have on here that are worthwhile mentioning. One is Liquify. Um, so Liquify is a tool that we've used a lot in Photoshop for slimming things down a little bit. We've got the warp turned on, we've got swell and twirl. I can very quickly use Lightroom on my desktop to liquefy the content and just to kind of give Dave a little bit more shape where he might need it. I can also go into his face and Lightroom, uh, sorry, Photoshop Fix will look for areas in his face that resemble a normal face and that is his eyes and his nose and his mouth. I can click on then his face and it will then bring out the points that Photoshop Fix has recognized. I can then click on his eyes and then I can modify his eye height or his high width. So you can see that if I move this around, it's making very subtle changes 
to his eyes. If I go to his nose, I can change the width of his nose. Um, but it may be that his smile needs to be worked on because he's really not smiling that much. So I go over to the smile and make him smile a little bit more. Okay, so quite a few things I can do there. And then the other things I might want to do is I might want to darken his t-shirt because it's a bit bright. So I can go in and go to the uh, to light a light will allow me to either lighten or darken an area just using my finger or again using the Apple Pencil on the iPad Pro I can then use that to do some work. Now I can apply this and this will apply the darkening area to that part of Dave. Really add a bit more contrast just in that area. So it's very nice and quickly to do that. If I click on the little brush I can then modify the hardness and the size and the opacity um, but I can also click on the layer here and this will show me an opacity slider that I can change to put the opacity on of that effect on his shirt and I can also see before and after of what that looks like. You can then clear that up, you can go into restore and then restore will allow you just to refine that edge, refine that area. And there's loads of things you can do there and notice what you're doing, what's happening here though is that the light value is now in blue. That means that this is a non-destructive edit so it means I can go and re-edit at any point in time. I can also put a little vignette on if I want to do as well and again that will go blue as well. So there's loads of things you can play with. I can even go down to painting. I can choose an area, I can pick a colour or I can go into the scene itself and pick a colour, maybe um, pick a little pink of Dave's face and then I can go into paint mode and I can paint this area of the scene in an area the same as Dave. I can also have blending modes on here as well and blend that into the background. Now, what I may want to do is carry on that work inside Photoshop. So what I can do whilst I'm inside Photoshop Fix is click on the Edit In and send this to Photoshop via the libraries or via Photoshop. Now, Creative Cloud Libraries utilizes the um, Creative Cloud Sync mechanism as well. So everything's powered by Sync. So I'm just going to go now into Photoshop. Photoshop now, as well as your applications like Illustrator, um, Premiere Pro, After Effects, InDesign and, and the other applications have got libraries built in. So the libraries now connect to the uh, Creative Cloud infrastructure and then surface the contents of the library inside the applications. So it's now it's sent it across to um, the library. I go into the libraries panel now in Photoshop. Hopefully this will have synchronized and brought that content across and I now should have a picture of Dave. It's still coming through, so give it a second. It should update, and I should get a picture of Dave. This is the only problem about using. Oh, here we go. So here's the content come through. I can right click on that and edit it and carry on my work on the desktop, even though it started on the mobile device. So it's just going to load this for me now. And what should happen is that the layers panel now will contain all the masks that I've used on the mobile device. So this will, um, my GPU is being used by um, different activities, that's why I'm getting a little bit of lag, um, but it will come through in a second, and then I can go through all the layers, I can refine the edits, I can turn them off, I can go re-edit the masks, everything I can normally do in Photoshop to refine the edit, I can do. So here we go, here's my edit, you can see here now that we have the base, we also have um, a light area. These are all the edits for his shirt, so I can refine those. I've got the paint element. I also have my vignette. So I can carry on working. So as you're working inside Photoshop Fix on the iPhone or the iPad and soon to be the Android devices, you're able to send that content through into Photoshop, carry on working and refine your content in a much, in a much better way. Or you could use Lightroom Mobile and trigger Photoshop Fix from Lightroom Mobile, edit on the fly, and then synchronize that content back into Lightroom Mobile so you can then carry on working that way. So there's two routes there into either Photoshop or inside Lightroom into, uh, into Photoshop Fix on the, on the phone. Now, one thing that we brought in uh, about seven, eight months ago now was something called Adobe Slate. And Adobe Slate is a great application that allows you to create content initially on the iPad. So you can go into the iPad and you can go
go into slave, which is an app, and then build your content. As part of our Max release, we then took Adobe Slate into the browser. So I'm just going to go into uh, Firefox now and go into Slate. So inside Slate on the browser now, you can then um, open your projects or make new projects or even look at old projects that you currently worked on or even examples that we have. Um, in fact, I made one today. I had the copy all ready to go and the images, um, so it wasn't you know, very complicated to put together. Um, but if I click on here, it will then take me into that experience and allow me then to carry on editing my project in Adobe Slate on the browser. I could equally do this on my, um, on my iPad and then it will synchronize that content from the iPad into the desktop. So you can see here this is my uh, Eagle Hunters and Nadams from Mongolia that I did uh, on a trip uh, recently. But you can see as I page up or use the scroll bar up to go into the page, you can see I've got my text and I've got my Nadams entry and I have some pictures. So you can see that I've got a nice little story there um, of, of my trip to Mongolia. I can very quickly add content so I can uh, click on a little plus icon at any point in time and I can add a photo or a photo grid or text or a link or whatever I want to do and I can go in and click and click on photo and because this is all linked to the Creative Cloud I can go in and uh, either upload content from my computer or I can go into the Creative Cloud or from Lightroom and I can also bring that through as well so if I go to Lightroom now this will go to Lightroom Mobile and you can see I've got all my uh, my Lightroom mobile collection, I've got my data color collection, I've got my, my Leica collection, so I can pick up my Leica social collection here, and I can find the image that I like, which I think resonates really well with this part of the story, and let's pull in this crazy horse, um, this horse tug of war they do, and you can see I can bring that through now, it'll render beautifully on the browser, and give me nice, um, a nice instance of that image, and then include that as part of my portfolio and I can now carry on working. At any point in time I can go to preview mode and I can preview that which will move it into the way that other people see that um, content when I publish it out and then it will basically give me a um, version. I can do that, give me one second. Okay, maybe it'll give me one second. Start that again, one second. Live demonstrations. Once I have my content, I can then um, publish that content. So if I go and share it, I can then um, put my uh, attribution, uh, attribution down to who created the project. I can make it public or private. I can choose a category and I can publish. When I publish this, and you can put it into a category very quickly, it's photography. And when I publish this, this will then get published onto uh, the Adobe servers, which will enable you to embed it into a web, bra into a web browser using or uh, a blog maybe, like something like WordPress, or maybe post to Facebook or Twitter, or send an email to somebody, or even just a simple uh, URL that you can paste into, into somewhere. And that then takes you to the um, read side of that content. You can see there that here's my story. Again, looks exactly the same with my modified content. So at any point in time, I can go and modify my content and get really beautiful images and beautiful stories. So it's a really great advancement to use uh, Slate in a browser um, or on the iPad um, and soon to become on the Android devices as well. So let me just go back very quickly to the end of my presentation. So I just want to finish a few things off and wrap a few things up. Um, the other thing that we released as part of Adobe Max is a rebranding of something called Adobe Portfolio. This is part of the uh, Behance, um, the Behance portfolio that you get as part of the Creative Cloud Photography Plan. Um, you get free access to uh, Behance, the content to publish your content out to the web, but also portfolio is a way that you actually have um, a professional looking website off the content inside Behance. So it gives you a nice way to render that on the browser or through a phone or through a iPad or other devices as well. So it's a nice way to have your content out in a very professional way. Um, also, something you may not have thought about uh, as a photographer because you might want to capture your own content, but Adobe Stock is a great way of getting content and rich content and accessing about 40 million images, 45 million images 
into your artwork. So if you're a comp artist or someone who pulls things together very quickly or a 3D modeler looking for textures, Adobe Stock's a great way as an additional purchase to actually take content in and use that as part of your comps or as part of your edits as well. So lots of good stuff in there. Um, there's a takeaway slide as well from, from me. So I have an active blog that I post on a Friday and YouTube channels as well. But I want to hand over now to Richard who's going to take you through some data color, um, data color specific uh, workflows as well. Cool. Thanks, Rich. As ever, what a lot you fitted into a very small amount of time. So uh, well done, mate. That's that was that's fantastic. And and obviously, um, what uh, yeah, a large proportion of what you were covering off there, uh, was some really good stuff as far as making photographers more productive. And a key thing there, of course, is is how does that fit into our our color workflow? So if I can just check first of all, with Richard, can you see my screen, mate? I can, mate. Yeah, absolutely. Good. That's good. Cool. So what what we'll do is we'll we'll talk about how to how to set up a color managed workflow, integrating in things like the Photoshop Fix and Lightroom Mobile into that that scenario here. Because of course, what we want to be able to do as creatives, as photographers, is be able to get into that situation where okay, I can see what I get. I the old acronym, what you see is what you get, and. In any workflow, of course, there's multiple places in which we can get things going wrong. And, uh, you know, with, with the joys of adding in extra screens, extra creative uh, solutions into the scenario as far as tablets and so on are concerned, there's lots of places in where things can get even worse, if you like. Um, more variables can be more problematic for us. But that's one of the fantastic features of Lightroom, actually, is the way that if you're using that as the master and you're using those other applications on, on the mobile devices as slaves, as Richard suggested, that really gives you a much more control and puts the backbone into your workflow. So you can use those mobile apps to be very, very creative on the move and just extend that working day and get more into it, basically, so that you're not you know, sitting there on a train, plane, car, etc., etc., and thinking, oh, I could be doing something obviously as a passenger in a car perhaps, rather than driving it, uh, but uh, but now you can. You can get in there, you can be editing and so on, on the move. But of course you can then get it back into your workflow and as long as your, your color managed backbone to that is set up from Lightroom in particular, and that's really going to put you in a strong situation. Now, the same thing applies to Photoshop, so I suppose what we're really saying is the the, um, the desktop applications, but Lightroom in particular, for what we're, what we're going to show you now very, very quickly, as far as being able to soft-proof output is concerned and basically apply adjustments globally to anything that's going out to a particular device, that's best done really in Lightroom. So what do we want to be able to do? We want to be able to capture our images. You know, maybe it's remotely via the app and uh, using our, our phone, as Richard was showing in, in his part of the, the, the session there. Maybe it's uh, you know, on a camera, on video even. Uh, but we're getting those images in. We want those images to be how we saw them in the first place. So we'll address perhaps something on that shortly as, as part of this little uh, 10 minutes of uh, color management uh, tips and tricks. The main part of our workflow is obviously going to be on that retouching. So that, that could be in multiple places. But we want to have our desktop and I use the term desktop, of course, loosely in as much as our, our key retouching machines, that uh, might be a laptop, obviously, nowadays, but our, our studio-based uh, machines, we want that to be the controlling factor, the, the, the hub, if you like, the, the part three there, the, the, the screens there where we're actually working on the desktop or plugged-in desktop machines. That's where we want to be going. And we want, obviously, to be able to know that what we're seeing there is going to come out. Now, whether that's in print, as it is in this particular example, or it could be, again, to uh, any any number of different types of output, like the web, like apps on on um, on you know on mobile devices again. But probably the the biggest area where we get changes, in particular for those of us who are photographers or going into design, is of course down to things like paper and print. Because just changing a type of print stock, a type of paper, can have a dramatic effect on how your image is going to be adjusting, basically, how it's going to be seen. And of course you can use that very creatively. So you know, putting some images down on a parchment stock can be far more uh, impactful than they are on a gloss stock. You know, all that good stuff. And we all know that if we take an image and we stick it into a newspaper, it'll bloat, it'll get dark, it'll get filled in because of course that's pretty low grade paper and it's like printing on blotting paper is the, the old adage. But of course every different type of printer, every different type of stock, every different type of ink is going to have an impact 
every different type of output is going to have an impact. People are going to th see things differently. So that's where we need to be doing something extra in our workflow. Now, what I'm adding in here in this bottom slide here, or oh, in this slide, the bottom part of it, is the same screen I'm looking at, that, that sort of master in inverted commas desktop machine. As I say, it could be a, a laptop plugged into a, a desktop screen, but you know, whatever you're using as your key retouching uh, computer. And that's where I want to be able to see what I'm getting. And of course, the issue is if, for instance, at the output end, we're using some sort of stock and printer combination that's causing some sort of an effect. And of course, when it comes to print, well, that's pretty much anything, because of course, printers don't necessarily have the ability to print everything you see on screen. But if you've got something pronounced like a, like a, a yellow parchment stock here, we need to add in on that same screen that we're seeing at the bottom there, these, these different stages. So we need to view. So it's the same screen over time. View on the left-hand side. So we're going to see, see, look at that screen. We're going to view our image. We're then going to soft proof that to see how that image is going to appear on that output. And then we're going to make adjustments. So as I said, those are the three stages we need to extend our workflow by. Now let's pop out a slideware here because it's very simple to do this. Um, in particular, a, a way of doing this very accurately would be once you've done that adjustment, you, you can get um, back to it as good as, as near as you can to the start. But, but you need some means of emulating that output. And therefore, Datacolor has something called the spider print, which allows you to print out test charts on every type of stock printer ink combination that you have, or perhaps that your printers that you use have, and then you can come up with a profile, which is essentially a fingerprint that tells you, okay, on this stock, for instance, as in the soft proof window there, it's going to look yellowy. So let's have a look at that in, in software. So let's, let's go and find uh, Lightroom, basically. So let's have a look and, and see, because Lightroom really is the best of breed solution for doing this soft briefing. Now, a lot of people, whenever I present, and uh, Richard and I present a lot of shows around the country and uh, and, and elsewhere, and, and basically, the amount of times I'll ask in a in a um, in a session, okay, who has soft proofed? And I'll get one or two hands out out of out of 100 or 200 people, and then I'll ask, okay, who uses Lightroom? And of course, I'll get virtually everyone in the the room. By the way, if you're not, we've got a promotion at the end of this 10-minute this section, which I'll tell you about, where you can get some discounts on uh, the Creative Cloud uh, Photographer Bundle, so stick with us on that. But basically, if you've got Lightroom, if you're in the Develop Module, and if you go to the bottom of that Develop Module, you will see a button marked Soft Proofing. If you hit Soft Proofing, you can then emulate how your images are going to appear on different types of stock. Because as I hit that, if you look over on the right hand side, you'll see at the moment it says proof settings, profile, Japan, color, 2001, coated. If I adjust that for something else, let's let's pick a different type of uh, stock, for instance, there's, there's my home Epson printer, and you, you should be able to see, even through the joys of the internet, uh, that that's, that shot has just become a lot, sharp, uh, lot more contrasty, basically. In fact, if I hit the Y key, I can then see a before and after. On the left-hand side of the screen is how I've been happily retouching. On the right-hand side is the effect that I'm going to get with the image. So if I zoom in, I can move across there. And you can see that it's slightly darker, basically, where we're, we're looking at that image on the right-hand side. But let's choose something that you can hopefully see even at home. Let's have a look at, um, for instance, my home photocopier fax machine. So therefore, you'll, you'll see that that's looking, as perhaps you'd expect, a lot more washed out on the right-hand side of the image than it is on the left hand side of the image and that's because obviously what we're doing there is we are emulating how that is going to print we're, we're applying the profile and we've produced that profile using the spider print we've essentially printed out the test charts that come with the spider print it, it comes with Mac or PC software so you can run out these test charts and you can build up this fingerprint of how things are going to look and instantly in Lightroom you can do this soft proofing to see how things are going to look when they come out and then of course given the, uh, sort of the large range of uh, adjustment features that uh, we've got in Lightroom we can then go in there and do our best to make what's on the right hand side look as much as possible like it does on the left hand side now in this instance I know we're going to be struggling because you know, the, the image on the right hand side 
is a is a soft proof. It's an emulation of my home photocopier, which I know hasn't got enough black capability. So it doesn't really matter how much I play around with this. I'm not going to get a particularly contrasty, a particularly dark image. I can you know I can do the best. Key thing is if you're looking looking at better printers, like for instance that Epson we were looking at just now, that gives us the opportunity to do a far better soft proof, and well, basically gives you something you can actually get to to very much look like it does on the left hand side. But once you've adjusted that image on the right hand side using the the, the adjustment tools there in Lightroom to get it as near as possible to that uh, that uh, original how we wanted it to look, we just need to go into our develop settings, save a preset, and then we can apply uh, give it a, give it a date basically since uh, whatever the date is third dot eleven dot 15 boy doesn't time fly and say that and then instantly you'll see that pop into our develop presets over here in the develop module and these are just little metadata files and you can see as I scroll up or down in the little thumbnail window above it how different types of presets will have a different effect on on our image here but if we then choose anything else that we want to be printing out on that uh, printer you know there's a whole bunch of different dots here we can essentially just apply the same preset to it and correct all of those instantly on the fly. So that's a major benefit of the joys of Lightroom there and of course that batch processing again just a fantastic feature and why I say it is really the best of breed for managing that workflow part. Now the key thing to bear in mind is if we're adding in this soft proofing stage into our, our workflow which we should and we're then adjusting and we're saving that adjustment so we can apply that to correct anything that's coming out what we really need to be looking at is a screen that we can trust and of course there are whole bunches of different types of screens nowadays I mean Richard is essentially has been using three whilst he's been presenting there but uh, you know we've all got different things like Wacom Cintiq tablets, desktop machines, screens that we plug into our laptops, our laptop screens we need to be able to calibrate the core ones the ones that we're going to be using as our default screens for making sure our colors are correct and that principally is going to be perhaps your Cintiqs, perhaps your desktop machines, perhaps your laptops, maybe things like projectors and TV screens, who knows, but what we need to do is to be able to calibrate those and of course those things change over time as well, you know, it isn't a case of calibrate once and you can walk away, I need to be able to say okay when I'm looking at my screen I can trust what I'm seeing there is giving me a true soft proof of how things are going to come out or how they will appear on other screens elsewhere and of course the solution with this is using something which essentially data color uh, are the best of breed for and that's the spider basically there's a calibration tool now this year uh, the spider fives come out so this is a new device newly shaped and uh, re, uh, redesigned nowadays capable of handling uh, curved screens, LEDs, able to do uh, 4K, 5K screens, projectors, so um, fantastic device, and what, the way it works is it runs a whole bunch of different color swatches in front of the eye of the device, the device is a plug-in USB based device, you can plug it into Mac or PC because it comes with Mac or PC software and it just runs color swatches that it knows what they should be and it very accurately reads those color swatches and comes up with a profile again, but in this case it's a correction profile for your screen or a correction factor for your screen and the profile of your screen so you know what your screen can show which is an important feature but also how to correct those screens as well. So essentially very simple to, to, to do but very powerful the main benefit of, uh, of calibration is obviously getting that, that uh, being able to see and trust what you're seeing. But one of the key things we've all been doing, as I sort of alluded to a lot during this uh, this little five minutes of, of talk so far, is okay, we're all moving into a more mobile workflow. We're all working on laptops in particular as, as much more of our default retouching engine basically. And that's why with the Spider 5 it's been redesigned to make it far more robust, far more um, uh, capable of taking knocks and uh, bashes and essentially being able to pop in and out of your bag so if you're on the move take it with you you should every time you go into a new lighting condition recalibrate basically so whip it out plug it into your USB slot calibrate away basically we've made a whole bunch of identical has made a whole bunch of, of improvements in there including adding in a, a, a finer honeycomb grid which really helps with 
screens like, uh, ironically, like shiny laptop screens from Apple, which both Rich and I use, or with things like the iMac, where you've got quite a big glass bezel on the front of that uh, that screen. And essentially, that 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 uh, that honeycomb, as you'll see there, this is the eye of the optics. It's a very big optics sensor, optics array, and what it's doing, that baffle, is, is channeling light directly onto the sensor and cutting down any light coming in from the side. So if you are working in not perfect uh, conditions, or you're working with something like a, a shiny screen or a, a thick glass fronted screen, then that's going to cut down and make that much more accurate. In fact, we're getting up to 55% improvement in accuracy on some of those shinier, less pro quality displays out there. So, uh, you know, really master, major improvements there uh, as far as being able to calibrate three different varieties. Go and have a look at the website, and you'll see uh, you see the costings there. But um, you know the uh, the important thing is probably that the pro is the the tool of most photographers because nowadays we've got exactly the same physical device in each of the boxes of the spiders. Expresses the entry level. It usually comes in somewhere around uh, eighty or eighty or ninety pounds in the UK, basically depending on uh, where you go. If you go to the the uh, data color website you'll see uh, prices in euros so if you're in a euro country you can obviously buy in euros but actually if you're buying from the UK you can buy on the euro site as well uh, you will be buying in euros um, the the Expresso is really is, is an entry-level device and doesn't have that white dot there which is the ambient light sensor which checks the lighting conditions that you're in and adjusts accordingly or tells you how to adjust accordingly that's ideal for working on the move, you really need that, and that's why the Pro is probably the most used uh, device for uh, professional photographers. You know, you go to a, a wedding or an event or a, an activity, a new studio, it's actually got that ambient light sensor testing the area. Now, there's, there's a whole bunch of other benefits of the Pro. We're not going to get a chance to go into tonight, but um, that's really the, the the tool of choice. But the Elite does give you that little bit more, in fact quite a lot more, there's a whole bunch of other features in there including multi-point sampling, so if you want to really get accuracy of your screens and know if you do have any hot spots on your screens when you're retouching, the, the Elite uh, does the, the, the job there and also if you need to be uh, calibrating projectors then you need to have the Elite. Uh, the Pro is somewhere around, I don't know, 140 pounds in the UK, 150 pounds in the Elite, somewhere around 220. But have a look on the, uh, the Data Color site because if you are that registered you can of course buy in Euros and perhaps get a, uh, save yourself a little bit of money or go to one of our resellers. So uh, that, that's giving you a little bit of insight there onto color management the being able to soft proof highly important so spider print very useful in being able to do that being able to trust the screens when you're soft proofing obviously you need a spider for that one last element that we'll just quickly talk about because rich mentioned and he was showing us uh, the joys of uh, his uh, his picture of the the statue of, of shiva there and of course you saw him using some of the tools on the even on the mobile apps for setting white point and white balance and of course that's very arbitrary unless you have something to aim for and of course the something to aim for can be something like a spider cube which essentially is it's like a grey card but it's not a card. Uh, what we've got here is effectively um, something that can be used in any pretty much any application so I'm going to show you in uh, in Camera Raw actually I'll quickly just uh, pop this open in, uh, in Camera Raw I think if I've got the, uh, the chance to do that. So let's, um, Let's quickly boot this open. So in, in camera raw, oops, not the right shot. As Richard said, joys of a live presentation. I don't know. Let's, let's, let's quickly pop into the Lightroom and see if we can find it there. Uh, but basically, we've got um, a little tool here which essentially pops in your pocket and gives you a frame of reference wherever you are. So there we are. There's the, there's the spider cube. And straight away, we can see here, it may look sort of hexagonal to you, but it is actually a cube. So this is the pointy bit point sticking towards you and it is tripod mountable and you can hang it as we have done in this instance into your scenes. Key thing here is it's not a card, it's a physical about four centimeter by four centimeter by four centimeter cube and it's made of a uh, plastic resin base uh, mix and effectively it's got two equal sides here. They may not look at it at the moment but the reason why they don't is because the light is coming in from the left making this side look lighter and that gives you a frame of reference you can use to do things like setting white balance and removing our um, 
uh, removing color casts from our image. So there, therefore, we, we're seeing it there in, in all its true glory. That's how we've shot it. So just as Richard shot that, that statue of Shiva, but of course what we want to be able to do is get our statue of Shiva, or in this case, our, our, uh, the lighting conditions we're in here, captured correctly as to how we saw it at the time. And of course, the way we do that is using, first of all, our white balance tool. We pop that onto the lighter side of our, of our cube here and use that to remove any overall color cast. So that's, that's essentially setting our white balance, removing any overall color cast. We can then use the known values that we've got on this cube. So this is a 96% white, because these are the two exactly the same size. And the reason why one of them is looking lighter is because it's cubic. And that gets around a key problem with cards. With cards, because as you move things in the light, they can change their shading, you're recommended to shoot a grey card at 45 degree angle to the light. Now that can be tricky because cards are known to blow away, they get creased up, etc, etc, et and they, they're not particularly easy to, to mount on things. Whereas here you've got something that's tripod mountable where you can hang in there. So as long as this little black dot, which is actually a hole, is pointing towards you, you can use the left hand or the right hand side to set the white point based on whichever of the, is the lighter, that'll be the one that's pointing roughly 45 degrees to the light source. So we've done that already, we've taken out that white balance, we're now going to quickly just set our exposure to get our exposure right for this shot and then we can apply the values to any other shot because again Lightroom giving us that tool to apply across a range of images. So we're doing that using the 96% square here, we're just going to drop that down. If we look at the histogram, we can see it says 99% just underneath it in the top right hand corner. So we're just going to drop exposure down until that reads somewhere around 96%, so a little bit higher still. So there we are, just down to about there, should be about right. Yep, 96 just about. So we now know we've got exposure correct. We also know that this around here should be about 4. Now, at the moment it's reading about 11%. So if I just drop my black down here until that starts uh, clipping in there. So that's yeah, just about four. What we've done there is we've essentially set our contrast, our exposure, and our lighting conditions, I removed any color cast. And again, now we can use that preset tool within Lightroom to say, okay, we'll call that our cube plant preset. And then we can create that. And of course, that gives us a plant preset for the, this Photoshop shoot, which we can then apply to every other shot taken at the same time. And of course, it will correct all of their lighting conditions for that capture at the same point, uh, to the same uh, parameters. So basically, a really good way of getting that capture end of our workflow correct. So we quickly covered off uh, multiple ways in which we can be setting up our correct workflow. Now, a key thing to bear in mind is that uh, about two or three weeks ago, uh, Dataco launched the Spider 5 Studio. So if, for instance, you do want a Spider Cube, a Spider 5 Top of the Range Elite, and a Spider Print, all in one go and also in, in a very nice metallic case, then you can buy the Spider 5 Studio and get it at a, a discounted price. I think it takes off about a hundred, uh, you know, somewhere around a hundred euros or pounds off of the individual prices of the, uh, the elements there. And of course that gives you that whole workflow from capture through uh, retouching to output as far as our workflow is concerned. So we therefore would recommend you looking at the Spider 5 Studio. Now, I think that's it from all of us tonight, folks. We're going to quickly tell you about the uh, the promotion I mentioned earlier on. So you can get, if you happen to have been uh, uh, interested in getting a, a data color product, uh, in fact, even if you have one recently, then go to the URL down the bottom here because you can get a up to 20% discount on the photography plan of the uh, the Creative Cloud from Adobe uh, for new sign-ups basically. So if you're not already on board, then go to that URL and you can save yourself 20% on that. Uh, not exactly astronomic amount that it cost you in the first place for, for the photography van because it is superb. I, mean, I think it's somewhere around 8.95 last time I checked for the, the, the cost of the plan per month. You know, and that, with that you get Photoshop, Lightroom, all the mobile apps that Richard was showing earlier on, plus uh, access to Behance. You know, it's a really fantastic package. So highly recommend that to you. If you want to know more about the color management side, then folks, go to that URL there and you'll be able to download an ebook. You can have it in German if you so desire, but you can also have it in English and I believe French as well and um, perhaps other languages. I'm not sure actually, I've never checked the other languages. Uh, but that gives you 93 pages of information 
on uh, color management to uh, get your teeth into. If you want to find out more, you can also see, there we are, a picture of my good self again. You also saw Richard's obviously got some, I'm now concerned he's retouching me using Photoshop Fix, but uh, I'll find out about that, no doubt, next time we work together live at a venue. Um, but, uh, but if you want to see uh, some product uh, training and reviews on various different products, go to the Next Tech, or go, to, go to YouTube and have a look for Next Tech. That's two T's and E-K at the end. And that'll give you a whole bunch of uh, free video tutorials uh, featuring my good self in some of them and um, give you some uh, some tips and tricks on how to use the, the cube and many, many more things in, in far more detail than we've been able to go into tonight, basically. Lastly, I'll say to you, if you have any further questions, we'll have questions and answers very quickly in a few minutes' time. Um, we're only going to be able to take, I don't know, about 10 minutes of questions tonight. Uh, but there is a free phone support number. Uh, it's European-wide two zeros eight hundred seven hundred eight hundred seventy or you've got the USA number there or go to the ticket line and you can also uh, pop in your questions into our submit a ticket area there the ticket support line and that can be on uh, any good questions on color management if we don't manage to cover them off in the few minutes remaining to us tonight lastly uh, don't forget, if you missed some of this, you can always go and view our pre-recorded webinars online and uh, and also make sure you sign up for the next one we're running as well. I think we're going to be running one with our friends at Canon in uh, in December, so we'll be having a look at some of their very nice printers and uh, having a look at uh, what we can perhaps tell you a bit more about where, where, where my session started off tonight. With that, folks, I'm going to say thank you. I think at this point we'll be...